Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the uh, seminar on uh, the FAO Inputs seminar on um, analytical data. And this time we are going to talk about fat and fatty acids. Um, I would really like to welcome all those who are already connected. And as far as I can see, we have already more than uh, 120 participants. I hope that this is a new series of webinars. And the idea is that we will talk about the analytical method, how to uh, present the data, um, and then to uh, present the different techniques. So um, I'm looking forward to the presentation and the discussions that you will have. You, uh, as the, um, as the uh, participants, you can enter your comment in the chat box and, the, and your questions as well. So um, I would like to introduce uh, you to the first speaker, who is uh, Srimulari Samtan, and he's going to talk about analysis of fatty acid steps, critical steps, and potential errors. Sri Mulari, you have the floor. Can you please share your screen? And unmute yourself. Hello. Can yes. You? Yeah. yes, we can hear you. We are looking forward to a very nice presentation. Yeah. So good morning all. Uh, today I'm going to discuss, uh, going to give a talk on uh, critical steps and potential errors in analysis of fatty acids. So my name is uh, Srimuli Sampath, uh, completed my PhD and working here as a as research associate in food chemistry division, ICMR-9 National Institute of Nutrition. Um, previously, I worked as a scientific officer at SRM Research Institute, SRM Institute of Science and Technology. Thank you. So today, going to talk about, uh, this is the outline of the topic that we are going to discuss. First, what is fatty acid? And the second one is like uh, analytical techniques used for fatty acid in food samples, quality assurance and quality control, sample preparation, like fat frame to fatty acid conversion, then uh, for the GC column selection criteria, and then uh, peak integration, challenging during frame conversion, uh, during fat, fatty acid methylation analysis, how to overcome the challenges, finally the conclusion. So first, what is fatty acid? The uh, fatty acid are uh, Based on the carbon chain, uh, based on the carbon, uh, based on the number of a carbon, uh, it can be categorized in short chain, medium chain, and long chain. Where uh, fatty acids are divided into two, like saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids. Where uh, saturated fatty acid without uh, double bond in the carbon-carbon atom. Um, Whereas in uh, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid uh, uh, have a, uh, a double bond, uh, double bond, uh, unsaturated uh, double bond uh, in the in the fatty acids. Like so fatty acid or carboxylic acid uh, with a long aliphatic chain, whether either it is saturated or unsaturated. Mm, uh, then uh, there is a to like cis double bond and trans double bond in polyunsaturated fatty acid. So, what are the techniques 
available for uh, analysis of fatty acid. Uh, there are four techniques, mainly nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, near infrared ray spectroscopy, liquid chromatography, and uh, gas chromatography. Where uh, among among the four techniques, gas chromatography is uh, widely used for uh, analysis of fatty acids in food samples. Um, when compared with the other uh, three methods, they have its own disadvantage like uh, low sensitivity and uh, need a relevant model library for uh, uh, high and the cost of the model is high and the poor sensitivity like uh, the repeatability is not that much good. So coming to the uh, gas chromatography for frame analysis like uh, there are two two uh, chromatography like gas chromatography uh, equipped with the flame ionization director which is high accuracy high sensitivity less sample consumption and easy to operate mm. gas chromatography mass spectrometry or uh, another uh, uh, gas chromatography technique where uh, um, where qualitative and quantitative uh, we can do like uh, but uh, when compared to the GCFID, the GCMS has uh, 10, uh, 20 fold uh, higher sensitivity than uh, GCFID. But uh, for uh, food composition analysis, especially fatty acid, GCFID is essential. So, this is the typical uh, uh, schematic representation of uh, the GC gas chromatography where uh, consists of uh, like five components. Number one is like uh, um, uh, carrier gas, where uh, this is the mobile, carrier gas, uh, where uh, this uh, gap, carrier gas, uh, injector port, column oven, temperature, column oven, detector, and uh, FID, flame ionization. This is the FID. Mm. So exactly like, uh, one meal of a sample once we inject it into the column the carrier gas will help to uh, carry the injected uh, sample which, which it is in volatile like that in the injector port that the temperature will be uh, uh, temperature is high it will volatile and it can enter into the stationary phase of the stationary phase column then it get uh, separated in the column and eluted uh, Eluted in the uh, detector, the, uh, the detector get uh, eluted, the, the compound will get eluted, and then the detector uh, will uh, ionize uh, the flame ionization detector, will ionize the separated fatty acid, and we will get the uh, chromatogram of the chromatogram based on the response of the uh, collected ions. So uh, this is uh, excellent uh, in separation and quantification of fatty acid, especially like uh, uh, especially like uh, especially like for fatty acid analysis. This is the most efficient technique for uh, uh, most efficient technique. So next we will move on to the quality assurance and quality control where uh, we. Uh, quality as, uh, quality uh, assurance by purchasing a standard mixture of uh, we can purchase the standard mixture from uh, uh, companies and then uh, we can uh, we can we can uh, do the uh, uh, we can do the uh, uh, linearity accuracy precision and everything with the help of CRM. Uh, why we need uh, this? Uh, uh, internal standard heptatechnoic acid uh, for uh, during sample preparation process uh, whether any uh, loss in the uh, any loss in the fame uh, by using this C17 as internal standard we can uh, normalize the loss of recovery and then also we can calculate the each individual fatty acid which is present in the sample so so mostly this uh, uh, SRM 
issued by uh, uh, National Institute of uh, Standard and Technology. So this is the sample preparation uh, steps for analysis of uh, fatty acid. Like uh, we take the sample uh, saponification by uh, KOH and uh, uh, methanol, followed by acidification with uh, acid hydrolysis, then uh, acid catalysis. Then collect the sample, uh, collect the hexane layer and pass nitrogen and uh, inject into the FID of the sample. So next uh, the GC column selection criteria. What are the column selection criteria are, uh, available? Like uh, we have to first look into the stationary phase where the compound will get separated. Uh, based on the packed material which is present in the column uh, and column ID, uh, column inner dia uh, should be like a, a point if uh, the column inner dia if, if uh, is less than point uh, point two is point two by the peak shape and peak uh, width and all it will give very accurate. Uh, whereas in film thickness also like will help us to. Uh, Separate the compound. Column length will, uh, if increasing the column length, the resolution of the peak separation also very good. So, for fatty acid, uh, for fatty, fatty acid methyl ester analysis, uh, we need a, a column like SP2560 and CPCL8820. Uh, 88. Especially uh, in our lab, uh, we have observed uh, uh, like a 37 uh, effect fame mixture uh, by using a SP2560. Uh, in, uh, in that column, uh, we faced uh, like, uh, but we faced uh, difficult to resolve uh, cis uh, and trans C18 is to one. But other, all the compounds are eluted, like more than 70, uh, like other, other fatty acids we have. Except we have a separated very well. Mm, even in CPC 80 or 88 also resolved all cis and trans isomer. These both columns are uh, very good for uh, separation of uh, 37 uh, fame mix of a standard. So here uh, you can see this is the uh, standard like a chromatogram of uh, two different columns which we have performed in our lab. So here in 37 uh, fame mix, we can see all uh, are very well separated uh, in this column. Mm. And, and the CPC also uh, for, for 37 fatty acid, this column is very efficient. And uh, But only thing is that, that C8 is to one cis and uh, like Eladic and Vasnik, uh, very difficult to separate in this column. But for in CPC 88, the separation of uh, like separation is very well, very well separated of all the compounds, all the fatty acids which we have in the standard. So, so uh, okay, we are uh, running the samples and we processed. Uh, uh, we get the results from the instrument. Uh, there are different types of uh, peak integration uh, techniques available, peak identification technique uh, available. Like uh, we should first construct a baseline and then uh, we have to uh, identify the starting and uh, starting and ending peak of the compound and find the apex of the peak and measure the peak area. So, there are different types of uh, baseline construction are there, base to base construction, base to valley construction, uh, valley to base construction. So that whatever the process and the uh, obtained result where uh, uh, we can, uh, by clicking this uh, single open icon, we can uh, open and uh, uh, do all the peak identification and uh, peak integration, and all the things available here. So we, we, if, if, uh, here you can see like uh, two different standards like one uh, the red highlighted are uh, 37 mix standard and the blue highlighted are the sample. 
that it is perfectly matching with the RT. So it, so each compound we can, uh, 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 we, we can find the area and everything. So this is the typical uh, 37 mix, 37 frame mix uh, standard. This is the following uh, parameters which we used for uh, separating uh, uh, the 37 frame. Uh, this is the CP sil 88 column. Uh, we can see how uh, distinct, how very well separated uh, of this car, this sample. This standard, the same uh, in the same sample chromatogram using uh, CP sil 88. If we, uh, if this is the result which uh, uh, we obtain from the GCMS like coconut oil, uh, we can see the uh, uh, lauric acid C to one is to zero, so predominant, and uh, um, whereas in fish we can see the uh, DHA and EPA, um, and also the uh, matrix of the sample. Here the number of uh, peaks are. Uh, uh, very late, like a number of peaks are uh, number of the peaks are less. Whereas in the this uh, matrix fish and milk are uh, high, we can see how uh, uh, many number of fatty acid are available in the fish and uh, these are all the things we have to separate very well. Uh, so we need a suitable column uh, so that we can uh, separate. So this is the same uh, sample chromatogram of uh, sample chromatogram of a plant food uh, using SP2560. Here you can see all uh, all the uh, like uh, all the fatty acids are uh, similar in trend. Uh, rice, legumes, root tubers, all the fatty acids are, fatty acids are uh, uh, excellent. Uh, this is the sample chromatogram of fish and shellfish where. Uh, here we can see uh, in fish, fish, uh, red squid, uh, crab, uh, all have uh, this D, uh, DHA, EPA. Whereas in oyster, there is a linonic acid. Very, it is a very like it is a different among the fish and shellfish. Uh, by using this column, we have separated the fatty acid. This is the sample chromatogram of goat organ using SP two five six zero. Where here uh, we can uh, see the results like uh, how the spleen and kidney were, where the uric, uric acid were, uric, eco, ecotrionic acid were more, whereas the other like uh, palm, uh, this uh, C16, uh, all, all the samples we have the similar trend except in spleen and uh, kidney. Specifically, it is there in the sample. So, what are the challenges uh, during analysis of pain? Uh, is like uh, when the peaks are merged, uh, we have to separate uh, by changing the optimum parameters like uh, column on temperature and uh, ramping, everything. And uh, routine uh, like uh, peak merging and uh, our retention time shift will be there. Uh, so, we have to monitor and uh, how to. Uh, rectify that issue, and we have to see we, these are all the problems like peak fading, peak point, and uh, some uh, unidentified peaks will be there. How to check that one? Uh, and then we have to look. There. So, for that, uh, how to overcome the challenges which we face during the sample preparation and analysis? Uh, so, the first, uh, first we have to uh, look this column, and then second is like. Uh, uh, for uh, for separation of uh, uh, our, uh, separation of uh, uh, milk repeat by uh, changing the oven temperature program, so we can uh, separate here. We can see the uh, how that the program temperature are ramping and uh, and all this. This is the typical uh, parameter uh, setting uh, images. And whereas in uh, any any like continuous injection of more than uh, 100 samples or more, so it will get uh, this liner and uh, inlet portion of the GC column and outlet portion of the GC column. We have to uh, routinely we have to check and monitor. And if any problem is there, we have to fix it correctly. So overall, like uh, gas chromatography is a well established analytical tool for. Uh, 
potassium methyl ester analysis in food sample and the uh, AOAC method 996.06 and that methylation are efficient for fatty acid 2 fatty acid methyl ester conversion SP2560 on the CP silk 88 column are uh, very good uh, separation of 37 uh, pain weeks and, uh, and cis trans isomers in CPC 88. So, throughout the experiment procedure, we have to follow the strict uh, QA quality assurance and quality control so that uh, there will be a reduction in the error. And uh, routine monitoring of, and maintenance of analytical instrument is needed to avoid the potential error. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Sri Mulari, uh, for the very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I have learned a lot uh, about uh, analysis and what uh, of fatty acids and what to take uh, uh, care of. Um, I think uh, we will have all the um, questions and answers at the end. So uh, can you please stop sharing your screen? Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Um, all the speakers who will not speak, uh, may I ask to mute yourself? And uh, I may ask now uh, uh, R. Anatan to give us a presentation on how to present fatty and fatty acid, acid data uh, per total percentage total acid, fatty acids, or per 100 gram total fat, or per 100 gram edible portion on fresh weight basis. Um, Anatan, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Blue. Uh, is my screen is visible? Yes, your screen is visible and you are visible as well. So uh, we are very much looking forward to your uh, presentation. Evening to one and all because uh, various participants from across the globe has participated in the webinar. Am I audible, Dr. Ruth? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, just for the confirmation before starting. So I'm going to talk on this topic, uh, the presentation of uh, the fat and fatty acids uh, in different forms like um, the uh, per percentage total fatty acid or per 100 gram total fat or per 100 gram of uh, edible portion on fresh weight basis. As my colleague explained uh, uh, how to estimate the fatty acid, what are the different techniques are available. Um, so I'm just going to touch upon the presentation of um, uh, the fatty acid in different forms. You know, the fatty acid is nothing but uh, 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 mainly three, four different forms are uh, available, especially the free fatty acids or uh, the phospholipids or the... So if you look at all these fatty acids, which have mostly the non-polar aliphatic chain with the little polar characters, but this kind of information, you know, the polar and non-polar are very, very important for various biological functions, especially for maintaining the component of cell membrane and uh, some of the fat, like uh, the fat is used as an energy storage component. Also some of the, the fatty acids like a cholesterol used as a precursor for other component, other molecules like uh, the cholesterol used uh, for uh, precursor for the vitamin D. So as you've seen in the previous presentation, this is a um, chromatogram, which we get out of GC. This is a standard chromatogram. And similarly, when we inject the sample, we will get the sample chromatogram. So what we will do with this chromatogram? The end of the chromatogram, you know, the post chromatograph play 
we have to identify the peak as dr murli said we have to integrate the peak properly then after identifying the peaks then we will get we can see in the last column the percentage of area depending upon the percentage of area then we will identify the the peak the fatty acids corresponding to the fatty acids then based on that we will report this is the percentage of fatty acid fame in the total fatty acid fame but if you look at various literatures as you say as you uh, like uh, as you seen in the previous slides so predominantly they are expressing in terms of total fat or the total lipid or per total fatty acids where we need essentially it should be expressed in terms of per 100 gram of edible portion which is very important where we will use this uh, denominator uh, in terms of whenever we wanted to to calculate the fatty acid intake from the fat without any error without any mistake so in order to get this kind of information how to convert the fame fatty acid methyl ester to fatty acid so uh, we are going to uh, see in detail um you know see so the converting fatty acid into fatty acid methyl ester is very very important step in the analysis of fatty acids uh, particularly when we analyze the fatty acid by using uh, gas chromatographic techniques so because there are so many advantages are there that I, i don't want to explain now but using the appropriate uh, method for the conversion from fatty acid to fatty acid fatty acid methyl ester then after that appropriate method to convert the fame into fatty acid is very very important where uh, i just to draw the attention from the literatures initially where i have taken this conversion factor how we have to derive for uh, for the example here is egg lipid so the egg lipid it's uh, identified lipid fractions are essentially three that is triglycerides phospholipids and cholesterols so among the three lipid profiles so fractions 65% is triglycerides then the 29.6% is phospholipids among the phospholipids the lecithin and the cephalin is um the majority of the phospholipids where so 24 24% and 5.6% is reported and then finally is the cholesterol the after identifying these fractions of the fatty acids then we have to look at the real estimation of fatty acid in gram lipid fractions where you can see 95 95.6% of the fatty gram fatty acids you can see in the triglycerides so similarly 70 0.8% in the lecithin and 75.6 g in the uh, cephalin so when we multiply the weight percentage of total lipids with the gram fatty acid in that particular lipid fraction we will get the uh, gram fatty acid in that particular total lipid so this is the conversion factor for each fraction then when we when you you know sum of all these individual fractions the conversion factor where you can see here individually you just multiply the weight percentage of the lipid fraction with the fatty acid and then you will get the fractions like this and this particular factor will be used as a conversion factor where we have to where we can apply to get the fatty acid from the total fat so similarly one more example where you can see for the beef and here also there are apart from apart from uh, triglycerides there are uh, many phosphodiel molecules have been uh, fractionated and their respective percentage of total lipid fractions and uh, estimated total uh, the fatty acid in particular uh, gram lipid fractions when you multiply both the characters you will get gram fatty acid which will be used uh, as a factor for the conversion of this particular food you know the fatty acid from the total fat so these kind of applications so these kind of uh, you know the conversion uh, factors have been extensively worked and it has been reported in our bible of our food composition you know the greenfield south gate uh, south gate book where you can see where different food groups with the uh, conversion factors but not only this later on you know uh, if you are in foods nawak et al they went in depth you know because in this in this table where 
the fish have been given only with the two different factors only with the lean mass and the fatty mass without mentioning the fat composition so fon foods further went in depth to analyzing to differentiate with the uh, for depending upon the fat composition then they have come to the conclusion that so we can modify this factor where if we have the fat content more than 0.55 gram so this can be used for different fish like uh, the fin fish using the 0.933 factor minus with the 0.143 with the total lipid so that the derived value can be used as a conversion factor so similarly if it is a less than 0.55 lipid content so are the fat content so again uh, the novak et al they have they have identified the, for the further investigation they made to find the different conversion factors so these are all the conversion factors where we can use exactly to find out the uh, the fat to fatty acid but apart from that you can see the literature expressed with the different expressions like uh, the fatty acid percentage of fatty acid or the percentage the total fat the gram per 100 gram of total fat gram per 100 gram total lipids in fact the last three is almost similar but whatever it may be as we saw in the previous slide everything it needs to be converted into gram per 100 gram of edible portion that is our uh, one of the important uh, um, agenda or one of the important factors so we need not bother so it's very easy uh if your inputs guidelines are available to convert these different in, uh, factors or different expressions into gram per 100 gram of edible portion so i am going to uh, express uh, i am going to explain some of the few examples because i cannot cover all the uh, calculations in the presentation i just wanted to uh, take uh, importantly the few calculations where i just wanted to explain the initially the conversion of the lipid fraction from percentage total fat to lipid fraction as a gram per 100 gram uh, for this the required data is we have to have the lipid fraction as a percentage of total fat with the fat in gram per 100 gram if we have this two data we can apply this formula where so in all, almost all the formula so we are going to convert the gram per 100 gram of edible portion unanimously okay where i have uh, taken the formula few 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 applications so here if you get Anand, this uh, may i interrupt you can you put yes. off your calendar please because if not we cannot see the whole slide so is a calendar pop up can oh. you yes oh, thank you yeah sorry um so when we have these two different data lipid fraction and the fat data when we multiply um with these two things and then we will get you know the um, the end uh, the gram per 100 gram of uh, edible portion so this is an example for the chicken egg i don't want to take much time where we wanted to look into the real uh, the problem or where we wanted to have little more time to the convert the data we can go directly and this is another example where you have to convert the gram per 100 gram total lipid to a fatty acid as a gram per 100 gram of edible portion here also you need individual fatty acids as gram per 100 gram of fat and it's a fat content if you have these two different data we can use this formula for example in this pike perch fish where the 16 is to 1 and 7 is a 0.4 gram in the particular fat and when you have the fat content as a 1.3 you just put it in the formula you will get 0.005 gram of this particular fatty acid in 100 gram of edible portion then if you have other uh, you know uh, different factors like uh, the if you wanted to convert from percentage of total fatty acid to gram per 100 gram of edible portion in this case if you have the total fatty acid you know the fatty acid the total fatty acid fact i uh, uh, fac id then it is very easy and if you have both you just to multiply with both and then ultimately you will get the value but the problem is if you uh, don't have the data fac id if you don't have the data there we have to uh, apply the conversion factor you know initially we have to convert the fatty acid into total fat where 
uh, for this also it is importantly required the individual fatty acid as a percentage and then the fat content and conversion factor and this is a formula to convert and uh, this is the example where we can take the meat chicken meat in the 18 is to uh, 1 is 26 percent of uh, total fatty acid and the fat content is 3.3 and the uh, poultry conversion factor is 0.945 so when we apply all these things using this formula then this particular c18 is to 1 will be converted into 0.811 gram per, per 100 gram of edible portion so as we saw in the previous slides this xfa can be obtained from our um, the food composition book readily and similarly if you have if you are not having the the total fatty acid per uh, fat or food again we can con convert into the, the fat into convert into fatty acids that can be multiplied with the fat then ultimately you can um, you know you can estimate the the individual fatty acid as a percentage of fatty acid into gram per 100 gram of edible portion it's very easy so where uh, we can take directly the fatty acid conversion but so this is the exact the calculation where uh, it will be continued from our gc analysis you know the previous presentation also we dealt mostly with the fatty uh, uh, gas chromatography analysis where we will estimate only the fatty acid methyl ester so once the uh, fatty acid methyl ester we did uh, we get from get out of uh, gc this needs to be converted into fatty acid and that too it's a gram per 100 gram of edible portion so this involves three different steps the first thing is we have to convert the methyl um, the fatty acid methyl ester into the particular uh, fatty acid by applying the shepherd factor it's so a shepherd factor is nothing but the molecular weight of the fame divided by the molecular weight sorry molecular weight of the particular fatty acid individual fatty acids divided by the molecular weight of fame so you will get separate factors once after converting this separate uh, the uh, fame to uh, fatty acid then it goes to the another uh, the formula where we have to apply uh, the the fame it needs to be converted into um, the fame into um, you know the individual fame individual fame uh, with uh, multiplying with the shepherd factor to get uh, the next value and uh, this value always will be uh, lesser than 100 where i just to show you the excel sheet where generally uh, we used to convert uh, for our regular analysis and that will be very easy to understand for you this uh, first step we have to convert the fame into fatty acid using the shepherd factor essentially the second step after converting this this individual fatty acids will be uh, multiplied with the the sum of the individual fatty acids and uh, the third step is we have to use our uh, the fat content estimated fat content and the conversion fat fat fatty acid to fat con conversion factors xfpa in order to convert the uh, complete the fatty acid uh, total fatty acids into the um, uh, the fatty acid per 100 gram of edible portion uh, so so these are the essentially the three steps involved to convert our uh, fame to fatty acid in 100 gram um so just uh, i'll show you sorry yeah this is the uh, um the sheet where i just wanted to explain this is our uh, the individual fatty acid uh, methyl uh, methyl ester for uh, particular samples where you can see the c14 is to zero like that is goes and uh, as for our uh, fatty acid composition all together it will give 100 as a percentage when we convert this methyl ester using the shepherd factor and that will reduce it to as per the you know the uh, factor and that total it's supposed to be lesser than 100 it generally it will be around 95 so after that so the this this sum needs to be used to convert this individual the fatty acids in the second step where we have to multiply this one in order to get this second uh, you know, if it is uh, this particular 2.68 in 95% or 90.058 uh, 
what will be the concentration in 100 in 100 percent so this is for the total fatty acid so like this after converting if you look at again this will become 100 then by multiplying with uh, the the fat content with uh, the uh, fatty acid conversion factor ultimately you will get the fatty acid in milligram per 100 gram of edible portion so sometimes if you wanted to convert the dry matter to you know on the fresh weight basis so you have to have your uh, moisture content and the, any particular uh, the nutrient in this case the fatty acids so directly you just take the dry matter by subtracting the 100 with uh, the water content you will get the dry matter and if you check the value for that particular dry matter what could be the uh, the value for uh, the fresh weight basis which is without water so ultimately you will convert the dry matter or whatever the expression expressed in terms of dry matter will be converted into the fresh weight basis or the edible portion also and there are some suggestions uh, which is you know suggested from the in foods guidelines i have taken most of these conversion factors on the calculations from the in foods guidelines so the main suggestion would be when we express the data in terms of uh, per 100 gram of edible portion uh, always the quality of the data will be good and it is easy for any kind of further studies like uh, the fatty acid intake uh, or similar kind of studies then the approximation if the value for the total fat is not available for the particular food or the conversion factor is not available for the particular food which can be taken from the similar foods but it, it, it will be the approximate value but we, it can be recommended to take and uh, always uh, in the final slide what we saw you know the conversion of whatever the expression given in the dry matter into the, the fresh weight basis or the edible portion is always is advisable for uh, you know uh, for more applications are easy to understand by other food composition uh, um, you know the followers so with this i i would like to thank uh, fao in foods for given this opportunity to present this particular topic in this today's webinar i have uh, acknowledged i i would like to acknowledge uh, especially uh, dr ruth and fao in foods for uh, the wonderful guidelines provided for uh, you know the converting the data from different uh, forms to uniform form and i also have referred for the uh, bible of food composition data for this presentation and uh, apart from there are some literature as well so thank you so much one and all for your uh, kind attention given for this presentation over to dr ruth Thank you so much, Anatan. Uh, that was uh, a very nice uh, presentation. And uh, I have uh, even learned a lot more uh, on how to do the fatty acid conversion. Um, could you please uh, stop sharing your screen? So, um, <clears throat> and uh, again, I would like to uh, tell the participants, if you have any questions, put it into the chat or in the question and answers. And uh, after the presentation of Anna, we will uh, we'll, we'll come to all your questions and uh, the presenters will, uh, will answer them. So uh, with this one, I would like to give the floor to uh, Anna Vincent. Um, and she will talk about the attribution of inputs pack names to silent fatty acids, the principles and challenges. Anna, you have the floor. Lovely, thank you. Let me share my screen. Is that sharing for everybody? Mm, not yet. So this, yes, we see the first slide. Excellent. And we can hear you perfectly well. Excellent. Um, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I'm Anna, Anna Vincent, and I'll be talking today about the attribution of Infood's tag names to fat and fatty acids. Ooh. Give me just one minute and I will work out how to move my presentation onto the next slide. There we go. 
So just introduce myself. Um, I'm Anna Vincent. I currently work at Food Standards Australia New Zealand uh, in the food composition section team. We have a couple of food composition publications, uh, OSNUT, which is our tables for Australian nutrient intake surveys, and the Australian Food Composition Database, which is our reference database. Um, I've previously worked with FAO. I was a consultant with Ruth, um, where the major piece of work that I worked on was the food composition table for Western Africa. So um, I'll start with an introduction to InFoods tag, tag names. Um, what are InFoods tag names? They're short combinations of letters and numbers. Um, we use them to identify components in food unambiguously. And the most important thing is they allow exchange of food composition data. So they're really specifically targeted for food composition uh, purposes. And I know there's lots of naming systems for chemicals, for fatty acids and for components for lots of different purposes. And so this is the one for food composition. I've picked out a couple of examples. Um, first example is vitamin A. The definition of vitamin A as a tag name is um, calculated by the summation of the vitamin A activities of retinol and the active uh, carotenoids. And so you can see that's definitely a food composition um, tag name because vitamin A doesn't exist as a single component, as a single chemical entity, but obviously vitamin A is of interest to us as a component. We want to know the vitamin A content in a food. Uh, and the other example I've picked out is AAE8, which is the uh, sum of the total essential amino acids, uh, which I've picked to give you an example of a tag name with a number in it. Uh, you can find InFoods tag names published at the InFoods website. How to use tag names. So the key thing to um, recognise when you're using tag names is that um, tag names differ if there are different analytical methods for the component that return a different result. So one tag name exists for a component if there's only one method of analysis or if different methods of analysis provides very similar values for the component. Several tag names exist for a component if analytical results are method dependent. And so for us um, in this presentation, the most important one there is the difference between total fat and total fat derived by analysis using continuous extraction. So the tag name fat and the tag name fat CE. We also have tag names um where that we can apply where we don't know what the method was and so in this instance if we don't know whether it was fat uh, total or whether it was fat total derived by analysis using continuous extraction we can apply the tag name uh, a tag name but we don't have to um, assign the incorrect one basically we can say we don't know what it is so we know in future when we come back to that data that we didn't know what the method was Key point is that data of different tag names cannot be directly compared or combined. So if you go to the InFoods website to have a look at the tag names, um, the website will include the following information for all of the different tag names. Uh, it will have the tag name itself. And so the example I've got up is F18D1. It will have a unit. It will have the name or it will have a descriptive definition. So in this case, fatty acid, 18.1. It will have the synonyms and it will tell you um, a selection of tables in which you can find that component. So I will point out something key. Uh, when you look at the InFoods website, the tag names will have a unit, but actually since 2003, the units are no longer part of the definition of the tag name. So when you're looking at tag names with fatty acids and when you're applying tag names with fatty acids, you'll need to define and clearly state the units that you're using. And when you're looking at um, data tagged by somebody else, you'll need to double check the units that they have assigned to the data. Um, so there are two key groups of tag names that are of interest to us. One is the tag names for total fat. So that's, um, that's including triglycerides, phospholipids, sterols, and all the other related compounds. And then we have a selection of tag names for fatty acids only. And so they can be for individual fatty acids, or they can be groups of fatty acids, or they can even be total fatty acids in a food. I'm um, 
I'm going to talk about total fat today because total fat is quite a common component, quite an important component, and for food composition is one that you will come across quite often. Um, it's included in most food composition tables and databases. It's on most food labels, um, and it's used in calculating the energy contents of food. So, as I said earlier, the analysis of total fat, the results from the analysis of total fat is method dependent. And so the two most commonly used defined tag names for it are FAT and FAT CE, and one where the method is unknown. There are a range of other uh, less common methods and expressions of FAT, for example, the one I've got there, FAT NLEA. Um, and so you can have a look at the website for that. I just wanted to put it in so that you knew that FAT, FAT CE, and FAT weren't the only tag names, they're just the most common ones for total FAT. Um, so I've got a summary here of the key, the key tag names for total fat. Um, fat, um, the tag name FAT, fat is the highest quality or preferred one. So it's um, total lipid in the food. The method is um, extraction is using a mixed solvent in extraction. Um, and so that is the one, that's the, the data that is the highest quality. Uh, Fat C is total fat derived using continuous extraction. Um, and so the comments for that in the tag names are, the SOX method has often been used to analyze for total fat using continuous extraction. And this method tends to underestimate the total value of a food. Um, you often see it uh, reported in scientific literature as crude fat. Um, and the general understanding is that it underestimates fat in cereal products. Depending on the application, this data is okay to use. It might be acceptable for non-cereal products or where fat is not available. Um, in various in foods, food composition tables, we have used fat C um, where, we, where that's, been, that's the data that's been available. Um, and I have a slide later on to show how we mark it in our food composition tables when we publish it. And fat where the method is unknown or it's variable is obviously the lowest quality because we're not sure of the source of the data. So publishing total fat. Um, when you're publishing total fat data, it's important to make it clear to your users um, which total fat tag name is being used and has been applied to your data. Um, so I've looked at um, some recent publications from FAO InFood, some recent um, food composition tables. Uh, and each of them, we've had a combination of fat and fat CE data, um, and we've highlighted it in different ways. So for the West Africa table, um, we used fat CE where we didn't have any access to data that was uh, had the tag name fat, and we've highlighted that fat CE data in the square brackets. In U pulses, the majority of the data were fat CE, um, and so in that case where fat data was available, where the higher quality data was available, it was included and indicated with an asterisk. And in U fish, um, fat data was preferred, but Fat CE data was used when there wasn't any fat data, and that was indicated as an asterisk. So that's they're the total fat uh, tag names. And so we'll move on to the tag names for um, individual fatty acids and total fatty acids. Um, so the key one is fatty acids total, uh, which can be calculated from fat and from um, the fatty acid conversion factor, as was explained in the last presentation. And we have a tag name, XFA, and that's for the fatty acid conversion factor. Um, I don't actually think it's published yet at the InFoods website, but we have used it in FAO InFoods um, publications. So it's a commonly used one. Um, the fatty acid conversion factor is the proportion of total fat that is fatty acids um, and varies by food. The published um, fatty acid conversion factors are available um, as, um, as discussed at the Bible, the Food Composition Bible, Greenfield and Southgate. So then we move on to different tag names for groups of fatty acids. Um, and so these are the most common ones that um, you will probably come across in food composition. Um, and they are the sum of total polyunsaturated fatty acids, the sum of total monounsaturated fatty acids, and the sum of total saturated fatty acids. There's also two minor ones, 
uh, fatty acids, other non-specified, which is um, usually a very small amount of fatty acids where fatty acids are present, but they can't be identified and they're used to get the sum of fatty acids up to the value that it should be. Um, and fat RN, which is the total trans fats in a food. And then we move on down to individual fatty acids. So there are tag names for each of the individual fatty acids. Uh, these tag names are of the form FNDM, where N is the number of carbon atoms in the fatty acid and M is the number of double bonds in the fatty acid molecule. The easiest and most straightforward of these is the saturated fatty acids as they have no double bond, so M is zero. So for saturated fatty acids, the tag names will be of the form F, number of carbon, D, zero. The example I've got here is F16, D, zero, which is palmitic acid. Um, for mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids, the tag names include the number of car carbon atoms and the number of double bonds. And they also go into more depth and they may include the double bond position and they may specify whether the fatty acid is the cis or the trans form. So what we have is effectively a hierarchy of tag names with the most general one being of the form FNDM, the first one in that table, where the bond position is unspecified. Um, and this is, the, so this is the minimum description required. So we don't know what the bond is, where the bond is, but we know um, where, how many carbons there are. Um, the second one, um, more detailed, indicates the double bond position from the methyl end, um, but doesn't indicate whether the fatty acid is cis or trans. And so then the most detailed uh, tag names include the double bond position, the number of carbon atoms, and whether it's the cis form or whether it's the trans form. So monounsaturated fatty acids uh, have a single double bond, so they're all, always of the form FND1. Um, so I've just pulled some out for examples. Um, the most general form then, the tag name will be F18D1, is the fatty acid 181. Then a more specific tag name for a subset of those fatty acids would be fatty acid 18 D1 N9, which means we've got a double bond at the N9 position. And then more specific than that is uh, 18 1 N9 trans. So that's the trans form of that um, fatty acid. So what I haven't probably put in the slide, but should emphasize is that the FNDM, the most general form, includes the more specific forms, if that makes sense. So that will be, that will include those specific forms. Um, polyunsaturated fatty acids can have two or more double bonds uh, and again um, bond position and whether the cis or trans form of the fatty acid, uh, whether we have the cis or trans form of the fatty acid may also be specified. Um, so the example I've got there is F18D2. We can then specify that down to where the bond position is and then whether it's the trans or the cis form. So as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of individual fatty acid tag names. Um, I've just pulled out some other common fatty acid tag names um, that you're likely to come across that are of interest, especially in nutrition. Um, one of them is the total omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the other one is the total omega-6 um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So they're, they're sums, they're normally calculated by summation of the individual fatty, uh, individual omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids. And then there are two individual fatty acids that are often of interest and they're alpha-linolenic acid and linoleic acid. So I just wanted to include them so you have them for reference. Difficulties in attributing tag names. Um, there's a couple of key issues, I guess, that I've come across in my work trying to attribute uh, fatty acid and fat and fatty acid tag names to data. Um, the first one that people often come across is determining whether total fat data should be assigned tag name fat or fat CE. Um, and the way to check, I guess, 
is to look at the method, um, including the extraction process. And so go back to those earlier slides where we have the, um, the methods and the extraction process as spelled out for FAT and FATCE. There's also some um, decisions to make, um, like I um, included in the earlier slide about the different publications about whether you have, if you have only fat CE data, well, that's the only data that you can use. If you have both fat and fat CE data, you can compare your fat CE data, check if it looks similar to your fat data. If so, then maybe it can be included, those sorts of things. Um, individual fatty acids are, can be just a little bit complicated just because there are so many of them. There's also lots of different names. So there's lots of differing nomenclature for fatty acids. And so you'll see them with uh, trivial names. There are, there's the IUPAC names, um, the Delta naming convention, the omega or N number, the carbon numbers. Um, I don't have any um, secrets there other than just be aware that there's lots of different ways that the fatty acid might be referred to. Um, and it's always good to check and look up and to keep your own list of um, the fatty acids that you're interested in and the various names or uh, nomenclature that you might see them under when you're trying to assign fatty acid um, tag names. And with individual fatty acids, there's often some uncertainty over the inclusion of the trans form. So if you're looking at data for a particular fatty acid, whether you should be applying a quite specific tag name that indicates it's cis data only, or whether you should be applying a general one. Again, um, depends on where your data comes from and what you're using it for. Um, the best thing to do is apply the most specific tag name you can, um, but in some cases you might not know, you might make a practical decision that the foods you're looking at um, are going to be low in trans fats, like I've got there in naturally occurring foods, oh, sorry, naturally occurring trans fats, so non-hydrogenated foods, they only ever make up about 5% of total fatty acids. Um, so you might make a decision that it doesn't matter that you'll use data that has both the data that you don't know. Basically, you can apply quite a general, the general tag name that doesn't specify whether it's cis or trans. Um, and I've just popped in some important considerations for dealing with um, fatty acid tag names, but I guess also key things for dealing with food composition data in general. Um, first up, what are the units of the fat or the fatty acid data that you're looking at? Um, as the previous presentation went through, there are lots of different ways to present fatty acid data. It can be presented in grams, in milligrams, um, it can be given as a percentage of total fatty acids. So it's always really important to know and understand what the units are of the data that you're looking at and using. Um, that goes for all food composition data, not just fatty acids. It's also important to know what the denominator of your data is. So whether you're looking at data that's per 100 grams edible portion, whether you're looking at data that's per 100 grams dry matter, or whether you're looking at um, one per 100 grams fatty acid, which is the same as the percentage of total fatty acids. Um, and again, um, important to know if you can, whether the data you're, including, you're looking at includes the transform. So use the most specific tag name possible, but if you're not sure, then you can use the general tag names that don't specify the cis or the transform. And I just included some references and further resources. Um, this presentation drew quite heavily on the FAO in Foods e-learning course on food composition data, which is excellent and I recommend to everybody. Um, there's also lots of uh, resources at the InFoods website, including the list of tag names. And um, the last link there is the Food Composition Bible by Greenfield and Southgate. And so that's me. And I think that marks the end of our presentations. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Anna, for this wonderful uh, presentation on input tag names on fat and fatty acids, as well as uh, for the uh, for its usage and the difficulties in using it. Um, I would like uh, now to go uh, to the different questions that we have received. Uh, one of them is uh, if uh, we will get the um, PowerPoints. So no, you will not get the PowerPoints, but um, this webinar is recorded and uh, we will publish it on the input website. There is a new category, which is called webinars, and this is where it will be published in due time. And uh, let us now go to uh, the more specific questions. So I think the first one is uh, for uh, Trimulari. 
Uh, can we use uh, in-house material for quality assurance rather than reference material? I had calculated the fatty acids from peak heights. It's come in high range, but when I use factor to converting fatty acids to 100 gram, then the result seems uh, accurate. Is there is any special thing which needs to calculate fatty acid from its percentage to gram to uh, gram um, per hundred gram? So I think we already noticed from the uh, presentation of Anatan that gram per hundred gram does not have any meaning. So it would need to be more specific. But uh, probably um, we can have the answer to the first part of the question uh, for the in-house uh, reference material. Oh, yeah, for the in-house material. Can you unmute yourself, uh, Simulari? Can I can I answer that as well? Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, yes, of course we can use the in-house quality control as a quality assurance um, when we establish properly. You know, so we have to use regularly until we get repeated analysis re reproducibility. It's good reproducibility. Once if you uh, develop up to maximum ninety nine percent. Uh, Reproducibility, of course, we can use. Even we use in our regular batch to batch sample preparation, one, one quality assurance which we established in house because uh, every time we cannot use uh, CRM or SRM samples because it's very expensive. Yes, as a conclusion, yes, of course, we can use, but we have to uh, establish uh, with uh, good reproducibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so the answer to uh, Dr. Saman Somro is uh, that yes, you can. You need to calibrate it with uh, certified reference material. Um, then there is another question for, uh, for Anatan. So the shepherd factor, is it different uh, for different food or is it constant? No, this is a food factor essentially not for the food, uh, food to food, but this is for the fatty acid, uh, methyl ester to fatty acid. So except the one methyl group, you know, the methylated fatty acid will be having additionally one CH2 where the only the 14 molecular weight will be uh, increased in, in the fatty acid methyl ester. It's not for food to food, but uh, SHF will vary fatty acid to fatty acid. Okay, thank you. Then we have another question uh, also on the method in uh, from uh, Kunshit uh, Jun Prason from Thailand. Uh, in AOSC, it is recommended to use uh, C11.1 uh, um, as internal standard. Why did you select the C17 as internal standard? The C17.0 uh, found in fish and the fish product, which may affect the calculation of each fatty acid. So this is uh, for uh, Sri Sumala, uh, Sri Mulari, uh, on the presentation that you gave. Can you please unmute yourself and answer the question? Uh, Murli, can I answer? Well, you know, uh, you are working in the same institute. Yeah, we are working together. <laughs> yes. So that's why uh, he's my colleague only. So I can answer for this question also. Yes, of course, uh, Dr. Kanjit. Uh, it's AOC recommended uh, C11, um, but uh, we are using C17 for all the plant samples. Even WHO also recommends C21 for uh, uh, some of the analysis. So C17 and C21 generally we use as internal standard. When the fish sample analyze, so we use C C C21. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, would you recommend using external standard uh, calibration for quantification of absolute fatty acids? 
And this is a question from uh, Michael uh, Pelagio. The question is, would you recommend using external standard calibration for quantification of absolute fatty acids? Yeah, we can do uh, quantification. Calibration we can do. So the answer is, uh, yes, you would uh, recommend the quant uh, calibration. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, please comment on a method that allows to distinguish between natural and industrial uh, trans isomers. This is a question from Hanna uh, Moiska. Yeah, this, this is a uh, question because you know the separating the trans fat, which is generally available the natural source from the Industrially produced, uh, partially dehydrogenated vegetable oil. So it's a big challenge, except you know uh, the different source what they used. Um, without that, we cannot uh, really. It's a very difficult uh, job to uh, identify the naturally present trans fats with industrially produced trans fats. So, um, if I understand correctly, there is no method which is uh, distinguishing with chemically between natural and industrial uh, trans isomers. Uh, let, let me add that. You see, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, we, can, we can do the uh, differentiation, but the, the thing here is the industrially produced trans fats is allergic acid. Allergic acid, but whereas the naturally occurring ones are the conjugate, conjugate linoleic acid, for which if we use CP CN88 column, we can we can differentiate those. So thank you, and uh, I would like to introduce you. I did uh, not do it at the beginning. I'm sorry for that. Uh, so who just spoke is uh, T. Longva, uh, from also from the uh, National Institute of Nutrition in uh, Hyderabad. So uh, thank you so much, Longva, for the answer. Um, then there is another question. There is a fairly limited number of fatty acid conversion factor in Greenfield and Southgate compared to the large number of foods available with mixed uh, uh, sources of fat such as cake that includes fat from uh, butter, egg, cacao, and flour. Um, how should we deal with this if we want to express our data as gram fatty acids per 100 gram edible portion on fresh weight basis? As uh, recommended by InFoods, FAOA InFoods, it's a similar food groups we can adopt. Yes, of course, I too agree. Uh, there is no, uh, the complete uh, exafia for uh, all the food groups are different foods are available, but the similar food groups can be adopted. That's what FAO in foods guidelines also is recommending. Okay, so uh, then what would you suggest to do to have a uh, weighted average of the uh, conversion factors or to uh, use uh, the one of, uh, of the highest proportion of the fat? What yes. would be the recommendation? Well, let's say um, for the egg, already we have the report. Um, or the average of all the individual the samples. Yeah, so uh, if we analyze cake and have a, uh, uh, the fatty acids are coming out. So um, I think the, the solution would be uh, the most precise uh, would be to use an average, a weighted average, uh, according to the um, um, fat content of the ingredients. Uh, if you want to make a more um, gross estimation, you take the fatty, con uh, fatty acid conversion factor from uh, the pop, uh, from the food which is giving the highest proportion of uh, the fat, yes. Then uh, we have another question. Uh, 
do you have any plan to include in format in formation on the methods? So this is um, a question then to uh, Sri Mulari. But what I think... Uh, Can you repeat the question again? Sorry? Can you repeat the question again? Yes. Do you have any plan to include um, information on the methods? So more information on the methods. So I thought that the uh, the information giving in the presentation were uh, very detailed. So uh, probably uh, Takeshi uh, Yasui would like to specify uh, the question in uh, in a new question. So I can, um, and then um, uh, Takeshi has also uh, a question to um, to Anna. Do you have any plan to include the information on the method used for FET determination in tag names? Because there are several different mixed solvent extraction methods. Um, I'll give my answer, but then I might turn over to um, Longvire and Anatan to double check. My understanding is that um, with a tag name, we only have different tag names where the different methods result in different results. And so for the mixed solvent extraction, I assume that even if there are different mixed solvent extraction methods, they all, um, they all supply a similar result. Oh, does that sound correct? Yes, that would be my understanding as well. Yeah. So uh, uh, if our analysts can, uh, can um, confirm that the different uh, mixed solvent methods uh, would uh, give the same results. Uh, well, it is not actually that different method will give the same result because the extraction will also depend on the material. Food metrics are very different from each other. So, for example, if you are looking at the uh, cereals, cereals and pulses, you need to take out the, uh, the fat that is within the cell layers, which normally the solvent extraction cannot do. So, we need to use an acid uh, extraction after which we use the solvent to, uh, to take out the, the fat. Now, when you use only, only the solvent extraction without the acidification, in the beginning of the material, you will get a different result. So normally for the for the fat estimation of cereals, it is recommended that the use of acid to break down the cell walls so that the cell wall fatty acid, which is normally the phospholipids. Yeah. So uh, the the thing is to do the acid uh, hydrolysis before the analysis yeah. and uh, you will get uh, more fat out of uh, the matrix than yeah. compared to not doing it. Yeah, but for you know, the items, for food items like meat sample, just chloroform methanol extraction is enough. You don't need to acidify, you know? just chloroform methanol. So the solid extraction is enough for meat, meat and meat Fish okay, thank you a lot. So, uh, and the last question comes from Nua Tsara. Uh, when we borrow uh, data for fatty acids, do we need to do a water adjustment? And this well, is, I think, more for Anna. Um, thank you for the question. And it depends on how you are borrowing the data. So, if you're borrowing from an FCT that is giving you data um, in grams or milligrams per 100 grams edible portion, then yes, you will need to do a water adjustment. If you have a fatty acid profile, so you have a profile that is um, proportion of total fatty acids for each fatty acid, then you can just take that profile and apply it to the total fat in your food multiplied by the fat factor. So it depends on what the data looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, thank you so much. 
Thank you so much uh, for the questions. I don't see any more questions, nor in the chat, uh, nor in the um, um, in the in the question and answers. So I think with this one, we have answered all the questions. And I hope that uh, every participant uh, was uh, getting the answers that they were looking for. Um, and I would really like to thank uh, all the presenters and uh, also Longba to, uh, to jump in uh, for answering some questions. And uh, I think uh, that was a very useful seminar and I truly hope that uh, we will have uh, more seminars in the future on analytical methods together uh, with the tag names and uh, on how to present the data. Because uh, it, is, uh, it is very obvious for some parts of uh, the, like the chemists on the chemical part, but they are not that familiar with the other part on how to use it and what are the difficulties in using it. And uh, very often, and uh, we also saw it in one of the questions, um, the data which are presented in, uh, even in scientific journals are not specific enough in terms of uh, units or uh, denominators so uh, that we can use the data or that we don't have the fat content or that we don't have the water content in order to convert the data which has been analyzed and uh, a lot of uh, funds has been and time has been going into the analysis. And then at the end, for food composition purposes, we cannot use that because uh, of ambiguity in the unit or denominator or that we have some missing data. So, And therefore, it was really very important also uh, when Anatan presented to say, you know, what data do we always use? And these are the data that uh, we would like every um, um, journal uh, to publish always at the same time uh, when they are uh, publishing the fatty acid data. Because if not, uh, it is really, it's a pity that uh, we are not able to use the published data to its full uh, um, potential. So, and uh, if anybody would like to, uh, to add something to the discussion, so um, please feel free, uh, Anna or Anatan Longva or Simulari, Please, uh, if you want to say something before we close the seminar. Let me thank you, Ruth, for organizing this great webinar. I think uh, this is the first step to take forward the techniques in analysis of foods. And, uh, and I think this is a very good activity that inputs have started, especially at a time like this. Uh, it will be very good if we can continue this with some other techniques so that people can understand more about the food analysis and the intuitive cases that are involved in it. Thank you all for attending this webinar also. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ruth for arranging this wonderful webinar on this particular topic. I'm very happy to present my presentation, but unfortunately we could not present in detail because of the construction of the time limit. I hope and the, um, future presentations more clarity but uh, at, at the maximum we have clarified all the doubts raised by the participants also if they have more doubts they can uh, personally also they can contact with more clarification so thank you so much for uh, all the participants i'll say thank you as well to Ruth and to fao for organizing um, and thank you to everybody who came along to listen Yes, and I see a lot of messages coming in, uh, thanking for this uh, wonderful seminar and, uh, and the content and, the, uh, yeah, and to the panelists. So uh, probably we can end this uh, seminar by clapping uh, to the wonderful presentation. So thank you so much. And uh, with this one, I would like to close and uh, hope that this is only the beginning of a series of uh, of webinars on analytical methods. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day to all. Good night. Good evening. <laughs>